Good morning. Our opening song is in our hymnal, Psalm 442, Each One Return. Yeah, yeah. The even verses 
Io sono un piano e... Well, it's good to see all of you this morning. I hope you enjoyed the worship service. Let's give our ministers and music a yeah. hand. Dr. Kendall says they're small but mighty. Amen. And they get us going in the right direction in terms of worship. Amen. So, um, that's what you I'm feeling kind of weird this morning. So, uh, keep me in your prayers. Hope you're going to get through and preach the word of God this morning. Amen. Amen. Um, this morning, I want to talk to the congregation about the mercy of God. So turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 3. The mercy of God. Of course, um, Dr. Kenny and his wife are on their way to the Carolinas, I believe. Um, yeah. And believe it or not, Dr. Kendall was excited about getting on an airplane today. You <laughs> guys know how much he hates flying. That, that's so. the Lord. That's the Lord. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so. so you can tell he was looking forward to uh, this, this time off. He texted me and asked me if the Browns were going to do it today. Uh -huh. And I texted him back and said, you have the better opportunity of flying the plane. <laughs> and the Browns are winning today. So the Browns, are, uh, they're, they're um, I hate to say that, they're, they're, they're turning me into a, a closet uh, Steelers fan. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the Steelers fans are clapping. Amen. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> okay, so we only have uh, one verse for our introduction. So let's try reading it all together. In 2 Corinthians Chapter 1, verse 3. Let's begin. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comforts. Amen. 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 Be seated. Before we start this morning, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come into the house of God. First of all, to give you the worship that you so just we deserve. Um, Lord, as we will learn in our scripture, uh, your mercies reign over us daily, and we thank God for that. Amen. Lord, um, there's no greater opportunity from the standpoint of standing in this pulpit than to share the word of God with those who are here today. Lord, we know that um, the only thing that makes the word of God relevant is the Holy Spirit yes. acting upon the word of God in our hearts and in our minds. Yes. So Lord, we truly say that may the spirit of God have his way today so that we might receive what it is that you have for us through your word. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so I'm trying to look more te te technology driven than I really am. Um, I have this computer, I forgot to download it on my iPad. It would have been uh, less daunting. But um, either way, we're here to present the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. 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 So the scripture tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Amen. And this morning we want to concentrate on He is the Father of mercies. Um, so let's talk about the difference between mercy and grace. Oftentimes those two are, are confused, um, but there is a difference between God's mercy and God's grace. So by definition, mercy um, is God not punishing us as our sins deserve. God not punishing us as our sins deserve. And if you don't know it by now, um, because of our sin, we deserve a lot of punishment. Amen? Yeah. But God's mercy, his mercy is not punishing us as our sins deserve. On the other hand, grace is God blessing us despite the fact that we do not deserve it. God blessing us despite the fact that we do not deserve it. So on one hand, mercy is God not giving us what we deserve, and grace is God giving us what we really don't deserve. Mercy is deliverance from God's judgment. 
I said, mercy is deliverance from God's judgment, or judgment um, as it pertains to our lesson. Grace is extending kindness to the unworthy. Grace is extending kindness to the unworthy. So uh, as, as we apply what we learned today, we want to do it in three phases. From the perspective of God and his mercy, how his mercy applies to us, and how we dispense mercy to others when we feel like it. I mean, I'll just add that in when we feel like it, right? How we disperse mercy to others. Now, I have 10 pages and I think 10 points. How many of you would like to get through all that this morning? You two in the back. Everybody up front is going, uh, we're going to get through five. That'll be good. So we'll try to get through five this morning. Uh, this will be a two-part series since uh, the Ken will be flying in um, uh, next Sunday morning. So we'll try to stretch this out uh, for two weeks. I know you guys are, you guys are like the Old Testament stand up and listen to the word of God for four hours. Um, some of the other people in here want to see the Browns lose. So. <laughs> let's, let's just be real about it. So there are several things that we want to notice by way of introduction. We need to first recognize that mercy is the result and the effect of God's goodness and grace. Mercy is the result and effect of God's goodness and grace. And I want to emphasize God's goodness. Can you say amen? amen. Are, are you in touch with God's grace this morning? Amen. I don't know. I don't know. If you turn to Psalms 35, verse 5, turn there. Turn to Psalms 35, verse 5. It talks about the goodness of God and what it means and how God dispenses his goodness to the just as well as the unjust. <clears throat> Psalm 35 and 5. If you're there, let me see your hands. Okay. Begin reading. Let be like a shadow before the land, when the angel of the Lord drives them on. What scripture did you just read? Turn to 33 and 5. Okay. <laughs> 33 and 5. I apologize. Oh, I'm glad that you recognized that that wasn't in context. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've all been trained well. <laughs> Psalm 33 and 5. Are you there? Yes. Okay, let's read that. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. The scripture tells us he loves righteousness and judgment, but the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So immediately it helps us to recognize the scripture that mercy is entirely the result of and the effect of God's goodness alone. Um, can't manufacture it. What little bit of mercy that we have and that we dispense to others, it comes from God. No other source or no other reason except from God's own goodness. Um, nobody's been feeling grace lately or mercy. Hey, those are shouting terms, you know? So let's go to point one. Point one, this is for the note takers in the house. Point one, God is essentially good in and of himself. God is essentially good in and of himself. Now, take a minute to think about that. The very essence of God is goodness. He is essentially good in and of himself. And not only is he the very essence of goodness within himself and of himself, but he is relatively good to us all. Amen. Relatively good to us all. So you may say, uh, Pastor Smith, or now Dr. Smith. <laughs> you know, I really, had a, I really had a difficult week. 
last week. In fact, Pastor Smith, I, I, I've had a difficult month. In fact, Pastor Smith, I've had a difficult 2015. How can you say good if God is good or relatively good to us all? So let's do a self-check. Can you think of 500, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000 people that just may have had a worse year than you? Amen? Amen. Amen. Really take it into perspective. So even if we've had a, last, uh, a hard time the last week, this last month, this last year, God was relatively good to you. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. 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 You were much better off than 5,000, perhaps 10,000, perhaps 5 million other people in the world. No matter how bad off your week, your month, or your year was. And that's because of the relative goodness of God. Yeah. But this is shown even in scripture. The fact that God is relatively good to us and that his very essence in and of himself is good is, a, is repeated in Psalm 119 and 68. Turn to Psalm 119 and 68. The fact that God is relatively good to us and that his essence in and of himself is good. You know, it's really a testament of the grace of God and the faith of God when you can praise God through tough times. Amen. Right? It's easy to praise God when things are going well. Right? And actually, uh, the way we react in our everyday environment when we're going through tough times is a testimony to those who are in that Amen. Right? So, I'll give you an example. Uh, recently on the job, uh, we've gone through this project they call refinement. And, and, and that's just a nice way of saying we want to lay off some people. <laughs> right? So, even myself, I didn't know what the outcome of this would be. But I have a job. Uh, you know, when they move me somewhere else, a lot of anxiety. And so, my wife is my gut check for anxiety. Okay, so when I come home crying about stuff, she listens to me first. Amen. She listens the first day, she listens the second day, and after that, her mercy stops. <laughs> and she tells me, okay, it's time to get over it, right, and live for the Lord. Yeah. Right? So the fact that God is relatively good, especially to us as believers, should be extended to those around us. So what that means is, how do we act when times are tough? Mm. How do we respond? Do we respond just like everybody else? Right? God is good to us. Amen. If you're in Psalms 119.68, raise your hand. Okay. Go ahead and read. You are good, you are good. Teach me the In this one very short verse, where we can find the fact that God is essentially good in and of himself and relatively good to us all. You are good and do good. Teach me thy statutes, is what the word tells us. He's not only good, but he does good as well. And we're the beneficiaries of that. He's not only good in his very essence, but his works are good also. Amen? It is the great design of scripture to present and reveal God as merciful. It is the great design of scripture to present and reveal God as merciful. On my way here today, I was thinking, uh, there's usually a halfway point that we stop at in Mansfield. There's a McDonald's there in my life. We usually stop there. And so I stopped there today. And so... As, as, a, as a pastor, as you prepare to preach the Word of God, you're normally convicted by the Word of God, right? That, that, that's the tough part. You're usually convicted by it. 
And so even in preparation for this message, you know, a couple of people came into the McDonald's and they had piercing probably everywhere that you could think about, or at least see. Okay, tattoos everywhere, right? And, and so, I mean, let's be real, sometimes we get self-righteous. There's a category of people out there that when we see them, we look at them and say, they deserve the judgment of God, right? Well, what is it that they really deserve? Or what is it that they really need? The mercies of God. But, you know, we get self-righteous, right? We get caught up in our theology and our doctrine, and we forget that God is extending his mercies to us. Because even at our best, without Christ, we are at our worst. It is a great design of scripture to present and reveal God as merciful. Yeah. And I'm yeah. saying this because sometimes we present our God as a God of wrath yeah. to others. Yeah. Right? And, and, and he is yeah. after the extension of his mercy. Yeah. You find this all the way through the word of God. The great design of the whole Bible is to present God as merciful. It is to reveal God to man as merciful. Other gods never reveal themselves as merciful. Amen. Think about Islam. The, the God of Islam doesn't reveal himself as merciful. When you talk about non-tolerant, as Christians, we're always, always defined as non-tolerant. Okay. The true Muslim... Religion, basically, if you don't believe, you deserve to die. That's why they call us the infidel, right? But they're, they're never seen as non common and that's a whole other thing. The whole purpose of the Word of God is to present God and reveal God to man as a merciful God. God's mercy, listen to this. God's mercy is a magnet to draw men to himself. God's mercy is a magnet to draw men to himself. But sometimes if you listen to preaching in the evangelical circle, you would think the word of God is to reveal God as only a God of wrath. So think about it. I think the, I think the last time... I present this message. I ask those of you who came to the Lord through hellfire and brimstone preaching, raise your hands. Well, only a few. We need to have a few more sermons on hellfire and brimstone. <laughs> feel a little warm. But think about it. Which, which is more appealing to a non-believer? And this is all around the scope of the Holy Spirit doing His work in the lives of a non-believer. What's more appealing? The grace of God. Or the wrath of God. So there's a perspective and there's a proper place for preaching on judgment. But sometimes we can preach on judgment until we're blue in the face. And then preach on mercy and it will touch some heart that the preaching on judgment never will touch. The love of God, the mercy of God touches hearts. And it is primarily designed to draw men to him. This is the great purpose of scripture, presenting and revealing him to man as merciful. And so I ask the question, is fear a lasting motivation? No? Is it? No, it's not a lasting motivation. The learning of the mercy and grace of God is a lasting motivation. And even as believers, we should be motivated by that fact. Never forget how much theology we have, how much doctrine we learn, that we still need the mercy of God. Amen. Something that we don't deserve. Amen? Amen? Turn to Exodus 34, 6 and 7. This should be easy for some of you because I know you were reading Exodus just last night. 
Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The purpose of the Bible is to reveal God as merciful. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. This is the second book of the Old Testament. We're still turning. <coughs> Exodus 34, 6 and 7. If you're there, read. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, passionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, in that scripture that describes God's mercy versus his judgment. Anybody know what that ratio is? No, the ratio. The ratio, the ratio in that scripture of where God is described as merciful versus his judgment. Dare I look at me on? <laughs> well, we're not talking about Pat, math here, Pastor. <laughs> It's six to one, and I, I'm saying that you'll get it. It, it. It's for a reason. There's six times in the scripture where God uh, is, is revealed as merciful, but only one, it talks about his judgment. Six to one. Want to know what they are? You're excited to know what they are, right? Yeah. Okay. The first time, it says, Lord God is merciful and gracious. That's easy, right? There's one says that he's long-suffering. There's two. Number three says abundant in goodness and truth. It's three. Number four, keeping mercy for thousands. Number five, forgiving iniquity. Number six, and transgression and sin. But it says, and that will be no, that will by no means clear the guilty. Here's his wrath, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. So this is a good illustration of how God extends his mercy more than his judgment. But when the extension of that mercy is done, then it's time for judgment. Amen? Amen. So let me ask you this. I would say there's probably someone in all of our lives who need to feel our mercy as opposed to our doctrine and our teaching. And how many times do we offer them mercy versus judgment and the wrath of God? So my conviction came because there's someone in my family who I need to extend more mercy than judgment, right? Because we like to dispense judgment. Right? We like to be the hand of God, the wrath of God, you know, you're going to go to hell. That's God's business. Okay? He'll take care of that. And when he does, he'll be good and taken care of. Okay? We need to extend as much mercy as we can before we do judgment. Now think about that in regards to how we treat both non-believers and some believers. Is the ratio between mercy and wrath that we distribute, distribute or convey to others the same as God? And this only comes from us understanding that the mercy that we receive and the mercy that we dispense comes from God. You get it? It doesn't come from us when we decide to give a handout 
or when we decide someone deserves our mercy, whatever mercy that we can dispense and that we receive, first of all, comes from God. Amen. Turn over to Exodus 33, 18 and 9. What point are we on? All right. Just checking to see if you're awake. 33, 18, and 19. Exodus 33, 18, and 19. Exodus 33, 18, and 19. You there? Yes. In reading? Yes. And Moses said, scripture, Moses asked God to reveal to him his glory. And what is it that God says? Read that scripture again. And he said, should be in the eyes of man is his mercy. And this is shown here where God speaks to Moses. And you know this, this, this proclaiming of his glory through his mercy happened after what event, Bible scholars? Yeah. Moses' children of Israel. After they had made the golden calf. Yeah. Right? So what did they really deserve? Judgment and wrath. But even then, God shows his mercy. God's glory is found in his mercy. All right, point number three. Doing good. You may even, meet, you may even get to hear the Browns kickoff show. God is more inclinable or more disposed to mercy than to wrath. God is more inclinable or more disposed to mercy than to wrath. So, well, we don't do that here, but if we were at the Baptist church, Sister Juanita, where is she at? Somebody might be shouting. Aren't you glad that God is more disposed to mercy than to wrath? And then, mercy is his attribute that he delights most in displaying to man. And we can prove that by our scripture. He doesn't delight in his wrath upon man, but he delights in his mercy towards man. It brings him great pleasure to show mercy to us all. Turn to Micah 7 and 18. God is predisposed to mercy rather than wrath. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Should have, should have done like you do in the Sunday school, the first person there raised your hand. <laughs> Micah, Micah 7 and 18. Read. says that he delighted in mercy. That's the old King James version. Or pardons iniquity in the NSAB. I, I challenge anyone 
to find a single verse in the Bible where it says that God delights in wrath, in judgment, and punishment. If you can find that, you win, well, I guess you just win. <laughs> As God people, are we? Are we more inclined to render wrath and judgment than even God? Yes. Not a verse anywhere from Genesis to Revelation where you find God has pleasure in judgment. But you can find many places where, where it either states plainly or clearly indicates that he delights in mercy. It's his joy to show mercy to the fallen man. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Yeah. Alright. I'm challenging your Old Testament scripture location. Lamentations. Chapter 3, verses 32 through 33. Some of us are mad at some people. And and, and we want to we want to render judgment. Um, but we forget about the grace and mercy that God renders to us. Oh. And, and you know something? It, it, it's our natural tendency in the flesh yes. to feel good about rendering wrath and judgment. Yes. Yes. But it takes the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. in our hearts, acting Amen. upon that mm -hmm. to render mercy. Amen. Are you there? Lamentations 3, 32 and 33. Yeah, go ahead and read. According to the cause of grief, and in the lack of compassion, according to his abundant and loving kindness, for he does not afflict willingly or grieve the sons of men. Crush. Do you want to read some more? But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercy. That he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. God does not grieve nor afflict men willingly, but he does so only upon, as the Bible calls it, great provocation. Great provocation. It is a good idea for all of us to read Lamentations chapter 3 once in a while. Because through Joshua and Jeremiah and others, judgment was preached. 840 times prior to God's wrath being dispensed on Jerusalem. 840 opportunities to get it right. I think I probably would have stopped it about eight. Some of you are probably a little more long suffering, may have stopped it 84. 840 times God preached judgment, had judgment preached. Giving people the opportunity to get it right. 840 times. Yet, when we get mad at someone, after one time, 941, <laughs> we're ready to let them have it. That's right. So let me give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. When it comes to God dispensing of mercy over judgment. So all of you have seen or are familiar with honeybees, right? Mm -hmm. Some of you, how many of you have been stung by a honeybee? <laughs> so what is the business of the honeybee? What's their chief delight? Making honey. Is it the same people? No. no. Of course not. What is the chief delight of the honeybee? It's to make honey. That's the main business. That's what he delights in doing, that's what he engages upon all the time, except after great provocation. Uh, right? How many times you leave the bees alone and don't leave you alone, right? Not after great provocation, he will sting. But that's not his main business. That's not his purpose in life. It is not his joy in life. Because what happens after they sing? They die. <laughs> they die. 
For this purpose, his main occupation, his principal idea, his reason for being is to produce honey. And this makes a pretty good illustration of how God, relative to his mercy and his wrath. His chief delight is to show mercy, but upon occasion, after great provocation, he must show his wrath as well, like the honeybee. So now you're looking at honeybees differently, right? <laughs> Sometimes the honeybees sting you more than once. <laughs> that sounds like experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, that must have been great provocation. God punishes, in other words, only when he can bear no longer. You know, America and the way it's going, I mean, God has shown great mercy in America. But someday that extension of mercy will will end, and the wrath of God will come. But that's up to the Lord. As it teaches us in Jeremiah 44, 22, where it says this, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of our abominations which ye have committed. In other words, there comes a limit when God just can't continually extend mercy. <laughs> In the Psalms, if we look at two references, there in, in chapter 103, verse 8, and then chapter 86 and 5, these two places together tell us that God is slow to anger. How many times have you heard that? God is slow to anger. That's our mantra, right? Slow to anger and ready to forgive. Again, this emphasizes the chief delight of the Lord as being, as being to show mercy to man. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. Amen. So any condition, the condition in which we find ourselves, there is still mercy from God. When we're at our highs, when we're at our lows, there's still mercy applied to us from God. It is the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. All right? Not giving us what we deserve. All right. Point number four. Mercy sets God's power working for us. Only oh. God's mercy sets God's power working for us. <coughs> Let's ponder for a moment who we are who we really are in our innermost being. Not who we are on Sunday. Okay? You, you know, you really get to know a person when you spend time with them outside of it. Well. Right? And that includes pastors and preachers and doctors, right? You find out who we really are when the Steelers versus the Browns, and I'm sitting at Sister Janet's house, right? You find out who we really are. So, I mean, really think about that. Who we are in our innermost being. It's only his mercy that sets his power working for us. And it works for us every day. In ways we never think about. In ways which we are totally ungrateful for. And yet his power works for us day by day. His mercy even makes his justice become our friend. Mercy. God's gift to us, even though we don't deserve it. Point number five. We're halfway there. God's mercy is one of great, uh, one of His great glories, of His crown. Let me rephrase that. God's mercy is one of the great glories of His crown. The mercy of God is the greatest jewel in the crown of God. Because of his mercy, we can approach him. Do we need to approach him? Yes. Yes. Only because of his mercy, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, can we approach him. Did anybody approach him this week? Did anybody need him? Did anybody approach him in prayer this week? 
It's only because of the grace of God that we can do that. Amen. His mercy, it makes him kind, loving, gentle, and good to us all. Even the worst men taste some of, God, some of God's mercy. Even those, even those that fight against God, they taste the mercy of God. And that was us at one point, right? Fighting against God. And even though some of us had moved over to the other side as believers, sometimes we still fight against the Lord. Even in spite of their rejection of God and the truth, yet in spite of that, they still get crumbs from the table of God's mercy. Because if they didn't, where would they be right now? Even the wicked get crumbs from the mercy table of the Lord. Yeah. Psalm 145 and 9 says that the Lord is good to all. Yeah. And his yes. tender mercies are over all his works. Mm -hmm. In other words, when he's saying here, the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. I think I just read that. The sweetness of God's mercy are on the thistle and the thorn on the cactus, the same as they are on the beautiful rose. Can we keep going? Yeah. Yeah. Point six. One act of mercy engages God to another. One act of mercy engages God to another. And this is completely the opposite of mankind. A man may do you a big favor. He may even do you two big favors. He may even be exceptionally kind and do you three big favors. But there comes a time when he says, I have done enough. Right? We all got that limit. Right? Oh, look, look, look. I'm going to help you out three or four times, brother. Okay, that, that's the limit. At that point, he's not inclined to help you anymore. When he's already helped you two, three, or four times. But God is just the opposite. His mercies go on and on and on. God, when he shows us his first and greatest act of mercy, is not inclined to cut it off. He is ready still to show us mercy. One act of mercy engages God in another. It's kind of like a, a parent's love for their child. Right? We love our children. And we extend mercy after mercy after mercy after opportunity. Even times when they really don't deserve it. We extend our mercy. That's how God feels about us. Multiple times over. Even more so, that's the way that God's mercy is to us. He delights in mercy. Point seven. We might get through it. Point seven. All mercy in the creature is derived from God. Amen. All mercy in the creature is derived from God. All mercy in the creature, that's us, that is in us, is derived from God. Do, do we understand that? Amen. Okay. Because it, I mean, it's really against our nature, <laughs> our sin nature, to be merciful. Amen. And the most mercy we have, or even can show, is only just a drop in the ocean of God's mercy. We need to think much more about this question of mercy. I've been thinking about those relatives or friends in my life lately, and I have to ask myself the question about my compassion, about my attitude, and about the mercy I show towards others. 
Because really, I want to show them the judgment of God. Not that I can dispense the judgment of God, but you can give them that attitude, right? So that they know, right? Like, look, okay, you need to get it together, right? And I don't have it together. I know we see so much evil in this world and it affects us, our righteous soul. As the Bible says about Lot, if we are not very careful, we will sometimes just feel like, you know, people deserve what they get. Just think about if we got what we really deserve. So that's not the correct attitude. What if God took, took that attitude about us? Wow. Wow. We'd still be lost. Oh, yeah. And we would have deserved everything we received. Yeah. Wouldn't we? Yeah. But thanks be to God, he delights in mercy. Which means, as children of God, we should delight in mercy also. When I speak of the mercy and compassion, it's not to say that we should compromise for sin. So, if, if you're a woman and a man is beating you, I'm not talking about you staying there and showing mercy. Amen. You can show mercy from another location. Amen. Get out. So we're not talking about compromising with sin. But we need to have compassion for the sinner. And so, you know, when, when we use that term sinner, we think of the non-believer. We probably should include the believer as well, right? Amen. We need to have compassion on people. Amen. What will be the magnet that draws people to the God that you believe in? Amen. Will it be your theology? Will it be your doctrine? Or will it be your mercy? We need to continue to hate sin but show mercy for the sinner. Again, we need to be introspective. There are more people out there that need our extension of mercy than our theology or doctrine. And don't get me wrong, those are important. Okay? But I guarantee you, as you extend the mercy that they don't deserve, they want to know about your theology and your doctrine. And sometimes you want to hammer on with the doctrine and theology. And they're like, I'm having a hard time, dude. I mean, I already got some conviction going on. I don't need you to hammer me. I need some mercy. As we read in our scripture, God is called the Father of mercies. The Father of mercies. He is called the Father of Mercy. Why? He is. What? He is, right? Because he begat mercy. All mercy comes from him. That's why he is the Father of Mercy. Without God, there would be no mercy of any kind in this world. He's the Father of Mercy. Amen. Just imagine, I mean, this world is pretty bad. Amen. In, in a lot of situations, right? But God is still good. Amen. But imagine this world without any kind of mercy. Wow. You think people are vicious and ruthless now. Amen. Just imagine this world without any kind of mercy. From any source, from anyone, from anywhere in the world. Right? So this it would really be like Hades on earth. A world without any mercy is unthinkable. And soon would become uninhabitable. You can't even imagine how bad it would be if there were no mercy. And yet without God being the father of mercy, there would be no mercy anywhere on this earth to anyone about anything. God is the father of mercies. He delights in mercy. The scripture reveals his mercy more so than his wrath. And you can see that in the gift that he gave 
his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 That's an extension of his mercy. And he didn't have to send his son to die for us. Right? He could have just suffered the consequences. God is the father of mercies. I'm going to end it there, but I, I, I want to I leave you with an assignment. Believers, I want, you, I want you to pray and really consider. I would imagine there's probably a person or two in all of our lives that we need to extend mercy to. Ask God to help you with that. Ask God to help you with that and see what happens as you extend mercy to them that they don't deserve. As we think about how God extends mercy to us that we don't deserve. I guarantee you they'll want to know about your theology and your doctrine. Mm -hmm. To those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I'm going to close. We have an altar with this coming. The mercy that God has extended to you is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the mercy he extended to you. Without that mercy that's been extended through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and all of us would deserve hell. Let's bow our heads. If there's a person out there today who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, think about the mercy that he has extended for you. Jesus suffered on that rugged cross for you. He had no sin. He took upon him the sin of the world. If there's a person today that has not accepted that mercy through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our altar workers are here to pray with you. Most of us, unless we're callous, when we're unsaved, we know we need the Lord. We just reject him over and over and over again. Today is an opportunity for you where God, once again, through his word, is extending his mercy yes. so that you may pass from darkness into light. Yes. Yes. If there's such a person, raise your hand. If not, Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you that you are the Father of mercy. Yes. Lord, we're so thankful that you really haven't given us what we deserve. Lord, as believers, give us the power to show an extension of mercy yes. to those around us yes. so that they may ask about the God that is within us. Lord, we ask the praise and in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.